Welcome to the World War I History Podcast, produced by the MacArthur Memorial, a museum and research center dedicated to preserving and presenting the history of General Douglas MacArthur, which includes the story of World War I and that of the millions of men and women who served in that war. In April 2017, the MacArthur Memorial and the Hampton Roads Naval Museum hosted a World War I symposium entitled Over Here, Over There. Jim Zobel, the MacArthur Memorial Archivist, presented this talk entitled A Frontiersman in France, Douglas MacArthur and the Rainbow Division in World War I. Douglas MacArthur, uh, there you look and you see his whole record there. Uh, first Captain Corps Cadets, youngest Brigadier General in World War I, youngest Superintendent of the 20th Century, youngest Chief of Staff, Architect of Victory World War II, Steward of Japan, Defender of South Korea, and you get all those great names, Protector of Australia, Liberator of the Philippines. It's quite a record, 52-year career. But this is the way most people remember Douglas MacArthur, uh, 70, 71 years old, in Korea, or maybe the World War II commander. Not many people think about him being in World War I. Heard a lot of people today. Uh, why are they having a World War I thing? I thought MacArthur was a World War II guy. But mostly we remember him because of this. And that's being fired by President Truman because he believed if you didn't fight the Korean War out, you'd still have that problem 70 years from now. But this is the way we know him. Uh, most people don't think of him. They just see the old soldier. You know, they don't think of him as this young guy, you know, the frontiersman. And that's what he called himself. You know, I am, I am a frontiersman. I was raised that way. And that's what we'll talk about today is Douglas MacArthur in the First World War and his experiences there. D'Artagnan of the AEF. The Beau Brummel of the AEF, the stick, the dude, seven silver stars, two distinguished service crosses, two Croix de Guerres, two purple hearts. The guy was in the middle of it. And that's what I mean, the frontiersman. I have to be there in the middle of it. And as Pershing would say, this officer has a very high belief in his own abilities. But he would also say, this is my best battlefield commander. It's always that dichotomy of MacArthur. I call him a frontiersman because he grows up out west. Uh, things and sea sites that most of us only know about because of movies as well as books. Douglas MacArthur grows up right in the middle of it. This is Fort Selden and Fort Wingate. His first memories are going across the plains in a covered wagon. When he dies, they're launching rockets into outer space. It's a complete paradigm shift in world history that this guy lives through. Four years before he's born, Custer gets his. I mean, he's growing up right in the middle of it. One year old, Billy the Kid catches it right where he lives down in New Mexico, six years old, on the frontier with his father. His father's a very famous uh, Civil War soldier and then uh, takes over a lot of these Western outposts. He's there when they drive the Golden Spike, uh, uniting the railroads. He knows the James Gang. He knows the Younger Brothers. He knows Wild Bill Hickok. I mean, you got to think about it. 1870s, you're in some town. There's only a couple hundred people there. If the James Gang and the Youngers ride in, everybody knows who they are. So you kind of read that in MacArthur's book, and you're like, yeah, sure. But then you think about it, you're like, yeah probably did. And there's Douglas MacArthur, six years old, with a rifle, where I learned to shoot and hunt before I could even read a book or anything else. Six years old, Geronimo's running right around where he is. That's what I mean. He grows up in the Old West. This is going to have a very definite impact on his whole psyche, as with does his father, Arthur MacArthur. First one atop Missionary Ridge, gets the Medal of Honor. He's going to grow up his whole life trying to be like his father. I have to do that. I have to be in the middle of the action. And his mom, always in his ear, you have to be like your father. You have to be like George Washington. You better be like Zeus. Like I said, life on the frontier, this is his whole aspect, being able to take care of himself, defend himself with weapons, camping outside, a men individualistic type person. Now he's pulled out of the frontier life and he's thrown into civilization. He doesn't make it. He can't stand it. And it takes quite a while for them, his family to finally get him interested in school or anything like that. What he wants to be, like his brother Arthur, who's four years older, is just like his father. His brother Arthur will go in the Navy, and he'll make his own record as a midshipman, and Douglas MacArthur go into West Point. It's something that he always wants to be. Even his father will tell a young Peyton March, who later becomes chief of staff, there's the makings of a soldier in that boy. 
Major General Arthur MacArthur. He had spent 26 years as a captain after uh, the Civil War and then finally got recognized by one of his former Civil War commanders. They brought him beast. He had this uh, meteoric rise through the ranks. And during the Spanish-American War, he's made a major general, goes to the Philippines. That's that whole MacArthur-Philippines connection, one of the first military governors there. And it's really a horrible thing that he's a major general top guy in the Philippines because that's the time when Douglas MacArthur goes to West Point. And because his father is the top guy in the Philippines and his brother is also serving in the Pacific, his mom comes to West Point to live with him. So, yeah, we got a mama's boy. Your top, your dad's a top guy over there, and he catches it every day. Hayes to the point where he even passes out one night. But they realize he's of sterner stuff, plays on the baseball team. They make him first captain, corps cadets, and they said it was not only in rank but in name. Everybody recognized, you know, that they, he had this thing, and they'll all talk about that. People will say MacArthur's aloof. He never has friends throughout his life. These guys were all his friends. And they all went through that crucible together. When he graduates, it's a whole new world. Colonialism all over the globe, the old Victorian age, new type of uh, steel, compartmentalized hulls and shipbuilding, artillery that can now reach uh, miles, uh, uh, cars, electric light. This is a whole new world, a whole new frontier that America is coming upon. And Douglas MacArthur, as a young military person, is an agent of that frontier. He'll go tour the Far East with his father, meet all the crowned heads of Asia as well. He'll be an aide to Teddy Roosevelt, work on the Panama Canal. But it's really not a life that he wants, building docks. He's got images of his own, the frontiersman. This is Fort Leavenworth in 1908. They're doing an a exhibition on blowing up the middle of a bridge. And you can show that we can do this shape chart so it doesn't hurt. That's Douglas MacArthur standing on the bridge on the left as they're blowing it up. I mean, always got to be at the center of the action. And that's what I'm saying. He's this engineer who has these dreams of this life. He writes all these letters to all these girlfriends he has. Thing is about MacArthur, everything he owns prior to 42 all gets destroyed in the Philippines. The thing that keeps cropping up all over the world are all these love letters to girls that he had. And in each one of them is like, I'm going to die in battle and you'll mourn me for the rest of your life. You know, it's, it's enough in a letter to scare any girl away. But they also point to this guy has this idea of the kind of person he is, which really isn't the life of an engineer. And really, it's the death of his father, Arthur MacArthur, that projects him into the halls of power in Washington where he gets noticed. Arthur MacArthur goes out the way you want to go. You're addressing your old Civil War regiment, 50th anniversary of your leaving your hometown, and you have a heart attack on stage and drop dead in front of all of them. And they take the old colors that he carried up Missionary Ridge and cover him up right there. Well, you see, Arthur MacArthur had fostered all these other people. John J. Pershing, Summerall, Tasker Bliss, Peyton March, all these people that are going to run the Army later. So they're all going to be looking out after Douglas MacArthur. So when Arthur MacArthur dies, Leonard Wood is the chief of staff. He brings Douglas MacArthur to be his aide. Leonard Wood, a frontiersman, Medal of Honor because of capturing Geronimo. He's the ilk that Douglas MacArthur likes to be around. Dad, Medal of Honor. Leonard Wood, Medal of Honor. Leonard Wood also knows how to work the press. And Douglas MacArthur is going to pick up on that. He'll be one of the greatest influences on MacArthur's life. But once... MacArthur gets there, and Wood was a rough rider with Teddy Roosevelt, San Juan Hill. Once MacArthur gets there, he's like, hey, this guy's got it on the ball. And he becomes like the golden boy of the War Department. 1914, where to revolution? Now, Diaz had been kicked out in 12, and Madero comes in, but he didn't find out if he was a reformer or not, because Huerta has him assassinated almost immediately. Now, there's word that there's going to be trouble. And the Navy goes to get some gas in Tampico, and the Mexicans take them all prisoner. They let him go immediately, but then Wilson wants a 21-gun salute in honor of every ship, and Huerta's not going to do that. So you've got tension, and you know that German arms are coming on a boat to Veracruz, so Wilson has the Navy go in and take Veracruz. Then you get worried about maybe we're going to war with Mexico. Leonard Wood will be the commander if they go to Mexico and have to go to Mexico City. So he says, I, see, I need some eyes and ears on the ground. Looks to Captain Douglas MacArthur to be that. Now, Douglas MacArthur's 34 now. His dad got the Medal of Honor at 18. Man, I got to do something. And he gets down to Veracruz. It's under isolation. Uh, Frederick Funston is the commander. He had been a great friend of Arthur MacArthur, his father. And Mac Douglas MacArthur shows up and says, I'm an independent agent. I'm here working for the War Department. And 
uh, Bunsen says, okay, well, you just keep me appraised of what's going on. Well, the main thing is intelligence. You've got to have locomotives if you want to go to Mexico City. There's no locomotives in Veracruz where they are. So MacArthur meets the provost marshal, this guy named Constant Cordier, who finds this drunk Mexican in a bar who happens to be a fireman for the Alvarado Railroad, who tells him the locomotives are 40 miles away. So Douglas MacArthur, I got to go get those locomotives and violates rank protocol, violates the quarantine on Veracruz, goes 40 miles behind the lines, takes the fireman with him, promises him $150 in gold. All he takes with him is a pistol. This is the, he has the Mexican search him, so he knows he doesn't have the $150 in gold with him. They have to make the trip there. They go 40 miles behind the lines. They find the locomotives. On the way back, they get jumped about three or four times, and MacArthur kills about seven people on the way back. He said the only time he really got worn out was when they had to swim across the Jamapa River because one of his compatriots had been shot through the arm. Gets him back, Constant Cordier says, you need the Medal of Honor. And it goes up to Leonard Wood, Chief of Staff says, yeah, give him the Medal of Honor. And then they, let's talk to Funston, see what really happened. They go to Funston and he's like, I have no idea what you're talking about. You know, because they didn't tell Funston what MacArthur did. Now, everything MacArthur did became the basis of operations there, but they signed an armistice that night with the Mexican government, so they didn't want to talk about MacArthur going out. Because another guy went out the same night MacArthur did and got captured, and the Mexicans killed him. You know, it could have been a major international incident. So Funston says, yeah, he did what he did, but I don't think, you know, we can give it to him because it violates rank and protocol and everything else, and then you're going to have every officer going crazy trying to get the Medal of Honor. And so they don't give Douglas MacArthur the Medal of Honor. And he didn't lobby for it or anything, but when they don't give it to him, he writes to Chief of Staff and says, I believe you've shown rigid narrow-mindedness in not giving me the Medal of Honor. <laughs> Douglas MacArthur comes back to the War Department. That whole fiasco is forgotten. He's back in his civilian clothes. The frontiersman is hidden. And you've got war in Europe breaks out while he's down in Mexico. Here's everybody that's all related. You've seen it before. The Kaiser and the Tsar and the King of England, and uh, they throw themselves into war over Europe, split it up. And Wilson, of course, kept us out of war. You weren't even allowed in the War Department to make any kind of statements about the Germans until the Lusitania gets sunk, and then it kind of starts changing. And the National Preparedness and the new National Reserve is created and everything else in the Defense Act of 1960. But as we've seen before, this brings them into the war. Unrestricted submarine warfare, the Zimmerman telegram, and the fall of the Romanovs convince Wilson that he can get into the war, making the world safe for democracy. And then once again, MacArthur, he, now he's the first press information officer for the Army, working in the general staff. And the Secretary of War is Newton Baker. He's on the right, and he sees, just like Leonard Wood, this guy's really got it on the ball. MacArthur's the guy who sells the country on the draft. They're going to need a million-man army. The whole country, all the politicians are worried about what happened in the Civil War when you had draft riots and thousands of people got uh, murdered in the streets, and they're worried this could happen again. MacArthur's the guy who has a newspaper man on his desk every day. He sells it to them. They, in turn, sell it to the rest of the country. Newton Baker recognizes that. Okay, this guy's got it on the ball. And then it becomes National Guard versus a regular army. Because the general staff, Hugh Scott's the chief of staff, they only want to use the regular army. There's a report going through the War Department that says that much. MacArthur, because of his father in the 24th Wisconsin, a militia group in the Civil War, he's a big believer in the National Guard. And there's a report going through the War Department, and it comes to MacArthur, and he writes on top of it, I don't agree, and I'm not going to elaborate. Douglas MacArthur. And the next person it goes to is Secretary of War Baker. He's like, hey, man, what are you talking about? And MacArthur said, you're going to need the guard. You need a million people. Let's get them in. They've been on the border in Mexico the past couple of years. Baker agrees with him. And so he hauls Douglas MacArthur off to Woodrow Wilson. And Wilson convi or MacArthur convinces Wilson to use the National Guard. But then it becomes, okay, well, which is going to be the first to go? Because if your state has a guard division that's the first or the last, they're going to be ticked off. And so MacArthur says, well, we can solve that very easy. Let's take a unit from every state. We'll put it into one division, covers the whole country like a rainbow. And that's where it comes from. This is William Mann. He runs a militia bureau in the War Department. And Mann went off for about 10 minutes and figured out, yeah, we can get units that can make up this division. So they come up with the All-American Division. It's supposed to be the first one to go. You've got two brigades, the 83rd, 84th, 165th, 166th, New York and Ohio are in the 83rd. And then you've got the Alabama boys and the... Uh, in the, or in the Iowa boys in the 84th Brigade. You've got Michigan and Minnesota and Illinois artillery units. You've got Pennsylvania.
Pennsylvania, Georgia, and Wisconsin machine gun units. It's taken from all these different states to build. They're supposed to be the first one to go overseas. They're not till actually the fourth, but that was the idea behind it. Then the thing is, they make MacArthur the chief of staff. He was a major in the engineers. He skips over lieutenant colonel, becomes a colonel, and he goes right into the infantry, where he's wanted to be the whole time. And the thing is, is they make this guy the commander of the division, William Mann. He's about 65 years old. He weighs about 265 pounds. He ain't going to make it. Because when they get to Long Island, um, all these troops start coming from all over the United States. They've got 500 acre plot there at the Hempstead Plains on Long Island and they start bringing them together, school of the soldier and MacArthur's really running everything. He's getting everything together. Man is very sickly throughout the whole time and it's really MacArthur who's putting this division together. And between August and October, they get it ready while Pershing is waiting overseas. Pershing will be the commander of the AEF. It was supposed to be Funston, who was that guy down in, in Veracruz, but he dies right before the war starts. And actually, MacArthur was the one who went to see Wilson to tell him that Funston has died. And Wilson was like, who should we get? And MacArthur said, there's only one choice, and that's John J. Pershing. Both first captains, though they won't ever really get along, they have this respect for each other. The Rainbow Division embarks October, November of 1918. They take many ships, about 10 to 12. Uh, there's different uh, departure times. They go into Liverpool. They go into Brest. They go into uh, San Nazaire. They're all spread out for those first couple of months that they get over there until they can get collected again back in France. And Saint Nazaire was the main port that they most of the Allies go in because that has a rail line that goes right to the San Miguel area, which was the main uh, point that Pershing always wanted to attack first with his first American army. They get to France, Pershing takes one look at Mann and says, yeah, you're out of here. You know, you, you can't make it. And he brings in Menaher, who's his own classmate uh, from West Point. Menaher will come in. He's a very um, stand-up guy. You know, he needs to run his division, make sure it runs effectively, and he will look to MacArthur as his chief of staff to make that happen. These guys get along real well. But then Pershing says, okay, you're going to be my replacement division. I'm breaking you up. Well, MacArthur writes over Pershing's head back to the Secretary of War. Say, hey, man, he's breaking up the rainbow. And Baker goes back to him, you will not break up. That's my division. You know, so MacArthur's already button heads with Pershing as soon as he gets over there. And so Pershing doesn't break it up because they've got all these political connections with all these different uh, National Guard units back at home, and they keep it as a solid division. The next division that comes in becomes the replacement division. MacArthur will always believe that Chaumont is against him. And one of the main reasons that they might be is when they were going to break up the rainbow, MacArthur started feeding information to this journalist who started writing all these uh, articles back home that uh, the rainbow's being broken up and it's this thing against Chaumont against the, and Chaumont's the headquarters of Pershing. And so they all find out and uh, the stories by this guy, Her Hubert Corey, all get silenced. And they find out later it's MacArthur who's feeding them the information. You know, he's going to do anything he can to keep his unit together. Pershing and him will butt heads throughout their whole careers till the, uh, until finally MacArthur guarantees Pershing's pension. And then Pershing thinks he's the greatest. But also, George C. Marshall is part of that showman crowd, and MacArthur will hold a grudge against uh, Marshall, even though Marshall's probably the most stand-up guy that ever has been and was probably one of the greatest allies he had in World War II, actually. Uh, the thing is, is when they get there, they don't break them up, but they take everything. MacArthur had uh, gained about 5,000 shoes. He had brought all the supplies, the division that they would need, but as soon as they get there, Shomon headquarters takes them all and div divvies them up. As well, MacArthur had packed the Rainbow Division with all his West Point classmates, a bunch of top-notch guys. Shomon realizes that takes 33 of them takes all the officers from the Rainbow Division, and then they want to take William Donovan, who had been on the, the, board, the border before the war, football player from Columbia University, very famous lawyer, one of the top guys of the 165th New York. MacArthur can't lose him. They'll have a strained relationship for the rest of their lives, but when they find, MacArthur finds out that Donovan's being taken, he jumps him into a car, drives to Chaumont, and convinces uh, Pershing and everybody else that, that Donovan has to stay there. And that's the thing about MacArthur. You know, it's like the same thing with Isaac an hour. He doesn't really get along with him, but he's not going to squash his career. You know, he knows he's good for the United States, knows he's good for the Army. It's the same thing with Donovan. 
They start getting into training. Vacalours, Quebec Don is where all the artillery goes. Langres is where they have these officer training schools. The trench mortar battalion guys have it the best because they're at this place that has heated barracks. Everybody else is living in a barn and has lice and everything else. Uh, MacArthur and Menaher get along real well, like I was saying before. And uh, the Rainbow Division shows up to find a whole, the whole trench warfare system. Uh, the British have just lost 400,000 at Passion Deal. The French have had massive mutinies because of the Nivelle offensives, which are a complete disaster. Uh, gas and artillery are now at the millions of shells for each campaign. The trenches are still there. Uh, you've got uh, tank warfare just starting to break out. This is going to really destroy the whole trench warfare system. And then as well, you've got the Russians fall, and now all the Germans are bringing all their troops to the west. And so the rainbow's showing up right at the point where the, the Germans are going to start making their bid. The thing that really brings the unit together is they have this march 40 miles in the snow. It's a, a raging blizzard, and this is what really gives them that shared experience and makes the rainbow a unit as a whole. Uh, their first uh, job is in Lunaville, Baccarat. After the uh, February, Pershing really only has four divisions that are, are worthy of going in the lines. The 1st, 2nd, 26th, and the 42nd. And this is about February time frame. So he needs to get him in there, train with the French. The 42nd will go into the line with the French 7th Corps under General de Basilaire, and they'll be with the 14th, 64th, and the 128th divisions there at the Lunaville Baccarat sector. This is a sector that was in part of the early part of the war. The Germans came in, destroyed the towns. It was atrocity filled. The towns are all still destroyed. Most of the trenches go right through the middle of the towns there at, uh, right below here at Ensorville. Yeah, the, the trench goes right under all the, the city buildings. MacArthur shows up uh, under this group, this new group to Basilaire. And Menaher, who's the commander of the, of the division, finds out that the French are going to have this raid. Uh, the Chasseurs de Alpine are going to go out of the Forêt de Peroy, which is up at the north part of the Lunaville line. And they go to see de Basilaire. And MacArthur's like, I want to go on that raid. And de Basilaire's like, well, what are you talking about? And MacArthur's like, I can't fight him if I can't see him. And so de Basilaire gives him uh, credence to go up to the front line where this raid's going to happen. So MacArthur and Menaher go up there with a couple other staff members. They meet this French officer who says, I can't take you any further than this. We're getting shells coming in. And, uh, and Menaher's an artillery officer, says, that is Launching fire, not receiving fire. Let's keep going. So they get up as far as they can, and the raid is already left. You know, the Americans are there with the French commander, and the the, the French are already gone. Well, Menaher's sitting there talking with the, the French commander, and he turns around, and MacArthur's gone. Him and Thomas Handy, who will be a four-star general in World War II, they see him running around this hill. They're chasing after the raid which is already out of vision, and nobody knows where they've gone. So MacArthur and Handy are gone all night long. And this Hugh Ogden, who's the adjutant, Joe's like, we didn't know where he was. We thought he was dead. Well, the next morning, MacArthur comes in and plants a German helmet right in the middle of the breakfast table. And they know they're in with a different kind of person because MacArthur's going to show up for pretty much every trench raid that's going on. And he's going to, everybody's going to know him. Everybody in the rainbow, they're going to think this guy's the king, you know, because they don't really know who he is. It's like, hey, buddy, who are you? Or because he's, he just shows up with a sweater, you know, the purple scarf that his mom made him, doesn't carry a weapon, carries a riding crop, has that crunch cap. He develops this whole mis persona that everybody in the rainbow starts emulating too. You know, the dude, the Beau Brummel, the D'Artagnan, this rakish character. Everybody gets in the line. They have to learn how it works. You've got centers of resistance, which go through Pont d'Appui, and then into groups to combat at the front. You've got to learn the rocket system, because if it's gas, you've got to light off a green rocket. If it's a barrage, you've got to light a, right off a white rocket with six stars. You've got to learn everything about how this trench system works. The French are there to treat them. MacArthur even writes a letter. You know, we have to learn from these people. These guys have been in the war for the past three years. Just lay aside all your pride and let them teach you how to do it. Salient to phase raid, March 9th. This is the Iowa group. It's going to go with the 128th Division people. They're all sitting there, F Company and M Company. They've got two different uh, assaults that they're going to make. And at F Company, all of a sudden, the Germans start hammering the positions with artillery. People are getting killed in the lines. They're all starting to uh, kind of get jittery. And all of a sudden, there's MacArthur with this French major corps, Bobon. And they're cool as can be. And they're just walking around. How you doing? Everything all right? Totally calming down everybody. I mean, they just got this persona about them that calms everything. Then they get into the raid. 
And MacArthur writes in his reminiscences, I was up out of the trench. I was 10 feet ahead of him. I didn't think anybody was with me. And then I saw behind me there was this screaming, you know, hellions bent for destruction. And then you read the French report of the raid. We walked across the field. There was nobody there. So that's MacArthur's memories of this salient de phase raid. But what he gets, he gets his first distinguished service cross here because of him being in the lines as all that shelling is going on. Some people just have the ability to steel themselves against that. As well, he was a demolitions officer for many years. Maybe he didn't hear it. Now people wonder, is this the job of the chief of staff? You know, he's going to get killed out there. He got gas three days after that selling to phase raid and was pretty much incapacitated for about a week. That's what he gets his first Purple Heart for. And uh, all the people and, and said, maybe, you know, maybe you shouldn't do this. But McCarthy says, i got to see. i got to know if this hill's been obliterated. i got to know if they moved the mortar positions, if they moved the machine guns. And Father Francis Duffy, who's with the 165th New York, they think it's a good thing. It would be even better maybe if one general got killed. You know, not MacArthur, but, you know, it's good for the men. So they go along with it. Pretty much. Now, Germany makes their bid March 21st. That's when they open the, the spring offensives of 1918, and they'll hit Amiens to break the French and the uh, British linchpin there and smash it pretty good. 40-mile hole, 40 miles wide. They're using the new Houthier tactics where they go past the first lines, get in the rear, and just start messing everything up. Stormtrooper, that's what that comes from. And Ludendorff really doesn't have any strategy. It's like, we're going to follow where the tactical success is. So he starts punching holes all throughout the lines. And so the French and the British have to start packing everybody into the lines. So now the Americans, they need them to take over certain sectors. So that's what happens here. Pershing offers the Americans to take over these sectors that the French are going to leave. The Rainbow Division takes over at Baccarat. Really, they're there for 82 days straight from March to June. The first one to take over their full sector. This is really a time where the Germans are also trying to get their best troops up to fight the French and the British. So here, they're just trying to hold them off with artillery and gas. And between this time, this really becomes a massive gas show in the Baccarat area. They'll stay there. They'll have over 3,000 casualties during this period. But this is where they really learn how to accept the barrage, which they'll need for the next uh, move. And this is what, this is what it looks like around the area. The gas attack victims over at the right. And they'll, they'll have thousands of casualties. That now at Charmey, they're moving for the next German offensive. They're going to get up near Reims, Chateau Thierry, which is, uh, east of Paris. And they're at the railroad yard at Charmey. And MacArthur's there. They're getting the division all loaded. And Pershing shows up. And he's like, this is the worst division in the whole United States expeditionary force. And it's all your fault. He's like, berating MacArthur right in front of all the troops. And MacArthur's just sitting there taking it. Because you see, everybody's adopted that nonchalant, crunch cap, rakish style. And they've all got this own look. Pershing's very much a stickler for military etiquette. So he is ticked off. And MacArthur just gets crushed right there in front. He's like, man, what did I do? Well, five days later, Pershing promotes him to Brigadier General. And that's how Pershing works, people. I'm going to destroy you, and now I'll build you back up. And plus his mom, MacArthur's mom, is right in Pershing because she knew him when he was a young officer. Why don't you give my boy another star? Remember what my husband did for you. They moved to the Champagne Defensive. Uh, they're east of Reims. Uh, now the, the, the first division has already been in heavy action at Cantigny up near Amiens as well. The 26th got crushed at Sea Chapre uh, in April, and the 2nd and the 3rd held off the Germans at Chateau Thierry in June, really. But in July, the Germans again start to make a push, and they're going to push right where the 42nd Division is, which is right here east of Reims. They're under uh, French 4th Army, General Henri Gouraud. This will be MacArthur's main... Uh, uh, inspiration throughout his career. This guy, they called him the Lion of Africa. He had lost an arm at Gallipoli, got blown up by a shell that came through. He's everything you expect in a military officer. And he writes this brief for all the rainbow men before the big assault by the Germans. It will be the worst shelling you've ever experienced, but you will hold and you will kill and get your kill aplenty. You know, it gets everybody all fired up. We're not going to live through this thing. July 15th, July 16th, this is the anniversary that the Rainbow Division always uh, looks to because this was the heaviest shelling they will get throughout their whole time in Europe. The German uh, offensives of 1918, this is the last big one they'll hit at the Champagne area. And Gros' whole thing is, is you leave the front line empty. 
Bring everybody back to the intermediate line. So the Germans will cream that front line. It's called elastic defense. And then everybody will be back here. When the German troops reach our front line, then we start crushing them with our artillery. And so it's this whole uh, way to kind of combat those Houthier tactics, stormtrooper tactics that they're using to try to get through. You've got, well, 165th, 166th Ohio elements here, and then the Alabama boys over here, and three division, German divisions will come against the Alabama boys, and about, well, one German division comes against the 165th, and the Alabama boys uh, hand it to them. And the Germans will say, we'll accuse them of atrocities. Now, the Alabamas, these are all backwoods guys. When you were at the camp, at uh, Camp Mills, they showed up. They had fought the New York guys in the Civil War. And so everybody back home in Alabama was like, when you get to New York, you better teach those New York boys about what the Civil War was all about. Now, they're crazy people that you don't want to be with in the camp. But when you get into the fight, that's who you want. Uh, because these guys are a bunch of wild men. And like I said, the Germans will, Germans will accuse them of all these atrocities. They do a big investigation and find out it isn't true. Uh, the Americans uh, hold them off here, as well as do the French. And then you get Moon to the uh, Ein Marne Offensive, because now that they've held off the Germans, they're going to start making the push against the, the Germans, who now are retreating back towards the Hindenburg Line, uh, because they've gotten crushed by all these offensives of Ludendorff, which didn't really lead anywhere except to massive casualties. At the Ein Marne, they'll run into this position. What it is, it's all concrete farmhouses where the Germans will leave machine guns as they're trying to push through. The Croix Rouge uh, had about 25 machine guns there. The Alabama and Iowans get into it in the Ein Marne. They're going to be driving from the south to the north. Croix Rouge is the first place they have to take, and all the Alabama units will take 50% casualties. Uh, it's a, pretty much a, a civil war straight on, uh, take it and lose everybody. Uh, then they'll fight through Ferry and Tarden Water. That's where the Weezine Cemetery is now, and try to cross the Ork River. Uh, it's during this position that Robert Brown, who was the commander of the 84th Brigade, uh, really lost it lost contact with all his troops, said they couldn't do anything because they were so uh, destroyed from the Croix Rouge, and uh, Menaher gets rid of him and puts MacArthur in command of the 84th Brigade. Uh, the last night of the drive, August 2nd, MacArthur was right at the front with the engineers, and they didn't start, they didn't hear any more fighting and, or any firing or anything. They went up on top of this hill, went about a couple of miles ahead and realized that the Germans, and that's the way MacArthur is every night. Hey, I'm not getting any resistance. Let's find out where they are. You know, I'm, I'll be the one to do that. Like I said, Chaumont, he's always worried about them being against him, uh, but they support him throughout the whole time. San Miguel is the next big one. Uh, this is going to be the first all-American fight. The 42nd will be in the center of the core line. you got the 1st and the 89th uh, right next to him. Uh, the Germans are pulling out as they go through. They get into this real bad fight at the Bois de Sonard. They'll lose about 1,000 people uh, trying to clear that. But it's, they take their objective in two days, and that's really what happens. Uh, with the whole drive into the Samuel Salient. The Germans are pulling back, and then MacArthur does this behind-the-lines excursion almost to Metz, and that's the main uh, German central keep in. He said, let's attack right now. They're all disoriented. The Hindenburg Line isn't manned. We can go through. He said they could have shortened the war by about three or four months. Everybody afterward even agreed that they should have done this, but that's something that's not going to happen just because uh, they had agreed to go to the Meuse Argonne. Uh, Patton and MacArthur meet the only time there at Saint Miel, and um, Patton said that MacArthur was always the bravest. Uh, Patton was the first one to flinch. You know, let's get off this hill. We might get. They go into the Meuse Argonne. It's really this place, the Côte de Châtillon. It's the linchpin of the German Hindenburg Line. MacArthur's brigade is given the uh, job of taking this. This is a two-day uh, fight where they have to take this. Once uh, it's taken, that's it. The, the drive is on. They tell MacArthur, you take that position or give us a list of 5,000 casualties. He said, my name will be at the head of the list. They don't take it the first day. Then MacArthur's like, we're going to have a bayonet attack. And his whole staff gets together. This is the dumbest idea ever. Let's change this right now. And they find out a way to get around the Côte de Châtillon, but they'll take it. And that's really what wins MacArthur's reputation in the Army. He's put up for the Medal of Honor. Pershing doesn't believe in giving it to uh, general officers. And he doesn't get the Medal of Honor. What he gets is arrested. Uh, at the end of the war, it's one of the last days, and they've made this uh, thing that well, gonna, the Americans are going to take Sedan before the French do. And so let's get rid of all delineation lines between the divisions. So the 1st Division crosses right over the path of the 42nd Division, and they arrest MacArthur for about three, day, three hours. He said, no, that, I'd never got arrested. You know, he did. 
They make him commander of the division for about three weeks, and then Flagler takes over. They go into occupation duty on the Rhine uh, until the until uh, about March of April of 1919. They're at Sinzig, Germany. Uh, MacArthur is suffering from gas. He falls in love with the Red Cross girl that is taking care of him. A uh, lady brought in all these letters from her father of World War II. He's an MP. They stayed in the same house in World War II. He rifled through the house, found all these Douglas MacArthur love letters on West Point Stationery to this girl. You please come to the archives. You can read them anytime you want. People said MacArthur never got married till he's 40 because he married the army. MacArthur not got married till he's 40 because he had girlfriends all over the place. The end of the rainbow, their last big uh, uh, review before perishing is March of, of 1919. MacArthur gets his second Distinguished Service Cross. You saw him before in the picture. He had the crunch cap kind of out of uniform. You can tell that Pershing has definitely had a talking to Douglas MacArthur. You will show up in full uniform. The rainbow uh, just kind of disintegrates after the war. They get reconstituted in 1942, uh, but it'll have uh, about five lieutenant generals. It'll have two governors, a uh, senator, a secretary of the army, secretary of the air force, chief of two chiefs, or yeah, two chiefs of staff. Some are all in MacArthur. Uh, this is a unit that every all of them come home. They become the hometown leaders, mayors, sheriffs, everything else. So, you know how you keep the boys on the farm after they've been to the France? Well, they're going to come back and run everything, basically. MacArthur, they said he wasn't the same after the war. Uh, Billy Mitchell, his two sisters, he grew up with them. He had dated both of them. And they said MacArthur before the war was a prankster. He was a jokester, liked to have a good time, could always laugh. They said after the war, never that way anymore. All serious. And throughout the rest of his career, World War II, occupation in Japan, Korea, all that experience from World War I will be the biggest influence on all of his thinking as he goes through, especially that armistice leads to another war. Thanks a lot. Thank you for listening. If you have any questions, suggestions, or comments, please contact Amanda Williams at amanda.williams at norfolk.gov.